Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're checking out the ASUS RX 6800 XT ROG Strix OC LC. Now this is an extreme high-end liquid-cooled 6800 XT graphics card and it's coming in at $900 US, so not a cheap one. And normally we would prefer to start with one of the more affordable models as this is the first ASUS 6800 XT that we're looking at. So normally prefer to start with a more affordable model like say the Tough Gaming. But for some reason, this is all ASUS has been able to send over. So not one of their cheaper models. And for some reason, this appears to be the case with all of AMD's partners. They're starting with their most premium, most expensive models. And then presumably sometime in the near future, we will get to look at the more affordable models like the Tough Gaming. Now we suspect that AMD has jacked up the pricing of this initial wave of AIB cards. And that's why we're seeing the prices that we are. Well, it's either that or all of the AIBs have gotten together to essentially price fix the market. Something that does seem less likely to us for a number of reasons. Firstly, price fixing is obviously illegal. So if they get caught, there will be some serious penalties for doing that. So yeah, it's unlikely that they'd all be in on it anyway. And we haven't seen this with Nvidia's Ampere GPUs, for example. So ASUS is offering RTX 3070 and 3080 cards at the MSRP with their tough gaming range. And the MSRP is something that other AIBs have managed to achieve with the Ampere GPU. So it would be strange if they'd gotten together just to price fix AMD GPUs, but not NVIDIA GPUs. Whatever the case, ASUS has now listed the Tough Gaming 6800 XT online, and the base model is coming in at $810 US. So that's $160 US over the AMD MSRP. That said, while they are listed online, I'm not sure if any of them actually exist yet because as I said, ASUS wasn't able to provide us one for review and they weren't, my contact wasn't quite clear why that was. So I suspect maybe they don't exist yet or perhaps it's just a case where they do exist, but they can't sell them at a reasonable price and therefore they wish to avoid any uh, reviews of these lower, what should be lower tier cards until the MSRP can be met or at least they get much closer to the $650 US price point because that would make for a much more favorable review. After all, let's be honest, $810 US for the tough gaming is just stupid when you can purchase the liquid cooled Strix version for just $90 more. Had these new 6800 XT cards launched at the suggested price, then I'd expect the RX 6800 XT Strix OC LC to cost around $800 US, so the current price of the tough gaming model. Anyway, Enough about pricing. Pricing and availability is just a massive mess right now. So let's take a look at this rather interesting looking graphics card and then work out if you should buy it once things settle down. So let's start as we often do with these AIB reviews by taking a look around the card and then we'll tear it down for a closer look. Now this is a hybrid cooled graphics card and that means it employs both air and liquid cooling. So it's very different to the other 6800 XTs that we've looked at already. And the most obvious difference is of course the big 240 millimeter radiator armed with a pair of 120 millimeter fans. ASUS has used this AO solution to cool not just the GPU, but also the GDDR6 memory, while the VRM is cooled using a traditional blower style fan, though it operates at such a low RPM that you'll never actually hear it. Now, because much of the cooling element is external from the card, the Strix OC LC measures just 277 millimeters long, and that makes it quite a bit shorter than the power color and sapphire models that I've already looked at. Unfortunately though, ASUS hasn't been able to fit everything into a dual slot package. Instead, the card measures 43 millimeters wide, which is about three millimeters too wide in order to take up just two slots. So technically this is a triple slot card, though it should still be suitable for mini ITX builds that only allow for a dual slot card. Of course though, it does have to handle a 240 millimeter radiator. It's also worth noting the card does stand 133 millimeters tall, and then you have to deal with the two tubes. So realistically, you'll need about 180 millimeters of headroom in your case. So that could be another issue for mini ITX users to deal with. As for weight, the card tips the scales at 1,338 grams, but with the radiator included, you're looking at a total of 2,223 grams. Now, design-wise, the card is pretty basic. The front side's wrapped in plastic with a few aluminum trimmings and an embedded blower fan. So it kind of looks like a very fancy reference card, at least from a few years ago when reference cards did use blower fans. That said, there's a huge amount of RGB lighting embedded in the front side of the card, along with the ROG logo on the side, and then two translucent 120mm fans featured on the radiator, which of course also include RGB effects. 
The back side of the card is also quite basic. Here we find a full-size aluminium backplate without any cutouts, though design-wise I think the backplate does look pretty cool. Then around at the I.O. panel we get the standard AMD reference configuration which includes a single HDMI 2.1 port, two DisplayPort 1.4a outputs and a single USB Type-C port, all on the now standard ASUS stainless steel I.O. bracket. So the card looks good, it's very neat, and although I would have preferred an aluminium fan shroud, I get why that had to go with plastic. That said, what I don't get is why there are so many individual cables running up the tubes to the radiator, and why they hadn't been custom designed for this model, as in made to length. I mean, I get that it is a cost saving exercise by simply reusing existing hardware, but come on Asus, this thing is a bird's nest. The photos on their website don't actually look too bad, but what you ultimately end up with in person is much worse. Why Asus didn't sleeve the three fan cables together is beyond me. This is after all a $900 US premium graphics card. So a bit of a letdown there, and although with a little bit of time and energy you can improve things, you really shouldn't have to when spending so much money on a high-end product, especially from a brand like Asus. So yeah, a bit disappointing, as I said, but let's move on and we'll tear this thing down. Okay, so with the cooler completely removed and disassembled, we have three main components. The plastic shroud, which we've already looked at, the air cooler, which is a basic heatsink and blower fan, and then the copper water block with pump housing. The block weighs 348 grams, and interestingly, it's not nickel plated. Again, something you might have expected to see on a premium product. Then we have the heat spreader slash heat sink. It weighs 300 grams and it's used to cool the VRM, making contact with the power stages and then some of the inductors. Quite interestingly, while the right bank of inductors are actively cooled, the left bank is forced to dump its heat into the PCB, and this side of the VRM did run quite a bit hotter, so I'm not exactly sure why Asus decided to do that. Then jumping over to the 342 gram PCB, which measures 276 millimeters long, we find 17 Infineon TDA 2147-270 amp power stages, 14 of which are used to power the GPU, with the remaining three driving the GDDR6 memory. This isn't quite as beefy as the VRM found on the PowerColor Red Devil, but it should still handle extreme overclocks with relative ease. Finally, on the PCB you'll find a dual bar switch, two 8-pin PCIe power inputs, and two 4-pin fan headers for connecting case fans. By default the card uses the performance BIOS, but there is also a quiet BIOS, though please note both use the same clock and power limits, with the only change being made to the fan curve. Now, in terms of clock specifications, ASUS lists a boost clock frequency of 2360 MHz, which is just a 5% increase over the 2250 MHz default spec set by AMD. The GDDR6 memory, on the other hand, that's been left stock at 16 gigabits per second. So when compared to other factory OC graphics cards, a 5% overclock is very typical, so it'll be interesting to see how much headroom is left in this liquid-cooled model. Playing shot of the Tomb Raider for 30 minutes saw the Strix OC LC peak at just 50 degrees in a 21 degree room installed inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D, which has been fully populated with fans. That's over 20 degrees cooler than any of the air cooled 6800 XTs that we've looked at so far. Now, in order to maintain this temperature, the fans spun at just 1500 RPM, which is a very low fan speed, and the typical core clock speed seen during our test was 2470 MHz, and this saw the power consumption for just the graphics card hit 321 watts, so an 8% increase over the AMD reference model. Now for manually overclocking the card, with the limits reached, which I should add aren't necessarily the limits of the card, but rather the maximum OC AMD will allow, we again saw a peak operating temperature of just 45 degrees, but this time the fans spun at up to 1800 RPM. Though even here they were quite quiet and really couldn't be heard over the case fans. The overclock saw the cores operate at an incredible 2750 MHz on average, and the memory also hit 17.2 gigabits per second, which is also the current limit enforced by AMD. Finally, when overclocked, the card sucked down 348 watts, so an 8% increase from the stock factory OC configuration. Okay, let's move into the benchmark graphs. As usual, we'll be testing with our AMD Ryzen 9 3950X GPU test rig with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL14 memory. The latest drivers available at the time of testing have been used, and for this one we have just a few select games to look at. 
And I will just emphasize again, because it did confuse a few people in the last few AIB reviews, that for these graphics card reviews, we don't pour over a heap of game data. It's a waste of your time, it's a waste of my time, as scaling will be similar across a wide range of games. And I found Shadow of the Tomb Raider to be a good title to test GPU performance with, especially GPU overclocking. If you want to see how the 6800 XT performs in a wide range of games, please refer to our day one review. Now, out of the box, the Strix OCLC was just 4% faster than the AMD reference model at 1440p, but a further 8% faster once overclocked to the maximum 2.8GHz frequency allowed by AMD. When compared to the base spec, we're looking at a 13% performance boost, which is quite impressive, and it was enough to match the stock RTX 3090. Then at 4K, we're looking at a 6% boost out of the box over the AMD reference model and an incredible 19% performance uplift once overclocked. Given the RTX 3090 scale is better at 4K, it isn't that surprising to find that it does hit the lead here, but still, 94 FPS on average with the Strix OCLC was mighty impressive. I was also quite surprised by just how power efficient the Strix OCLC is, roughly matching the power consumption of the power color Red Devil out of the box. That's an 8% increase over the AMD reference card, and we did only see a 6% performance improvement at 4K, but still, that's not bad for a factory OC model. My max overclock increased power usage by a further 8%, and we're looking at comparable power consumption to that of the RTX 3090, which again, isn't that bad given that the performance was comparable. It was also interesting to note that the Strix OCLC consumed 4% less power than the Sapphire Nitro Plus, despite overclocking much further. Okay, so here's a look at operating temperatures, and as you'd expect, the Strix OCLC runs much cooler than the air-cooled models from PowerColor and Sapphire. The GPU die temperature peaked at just 50 degrees, whereas other models tested so far were 22 to 25 degrees hotter. So a massive difference there, and this no doubt played a key role in achieving that 2.8 GHz overclock. The GDDR6 memory also ran very cool, peaking at just 53 degrees, which is a 9 degree reduction when compared to the Red Devil, and 15 degrees cooler than the Nitro Plus. Then finally, the VRM peaked at 59 degrees, and this temperature was recorded on the left side of the card, the side without the active cooling for the inductors. Even so, that's an extremely low VRM temperature, and really memory and VRM temps were not even close to becoming an issue on any of the other 6800 XTs that we've looked at so far, so the Strix OCLC is kind of overkill here, but we also kind of like that. Now, with the card's operating volume noise normalized to 40 decibels, the Strix OCLC dropped the GPU temperature by 5 degrees, the memory temp by 2 degrees, and the VRM by 6 degrees. Given the card was already running incredibly cool out of the box, there's little point in manually cranking up the fan speed. In terms of cooling performance, the ASUS RX 6800 XT Strix OCLC is extremely impressive as you'd probably expect it to be. It's cooler and quieter than any other 6800 XT that I've seen to date, though of course it is also a good bit more expensive at $900 US. Obviously, if you care about value, this just isn't the card for you. There's simply no justifying an almost 40% price premium over the $650 US MSRP of the AMD reference model. Of course, you can't actually buy that model right now anyway, so I'm working under the assumption that you will be able to in four to eight weeks. That said, had pricing been as, I would say, expected, and models like the Tough Gaming were selling for $650 US, then I think the Strix OCLC might only have cost about $800, and that'd be a 23% premium, which I think is much easier to justify, at least in my opinion. Most 6800 XTs will overclock to at least 2.6 GHz, so really we're only talking about an 8% overclock frequency advantage with the Strix OCLC, that said, you can hack the BIOS to remove the limits, and we haven't explored that yet, but this is something you'd want to do if you are buying this card, I imagine, and this is probably the type of person the card's for, those who are willing to tinker in order to get the most performance possible. Price aside, the only other issue I have with the Strix OCLC is the messy wiring with the fans. You'd think that ASUS could have quite easily come up with a much neater solution, and really that would be a better fit for a high-end premium graphics card. Anyway, overall, a very impressive graphics card and an ideal option for overclockers who want an all-in-one solution. And that is going to do it for our review of the ASUS RX 6800 XT Strix OCLC. If you enjoyed this video, 
you know what to do. You can also subscribe for more content from Harbour Unboxed. And if you'd like to become a member of the Harbour Unboxed community, then check out our Patreon and or Floatplane accounts. The links for those are in the video description. You'll get access to our exclusive Discord chat for Harbour Unboxed members. So a really cool uh, Harbour Unboxed community over there. We also have a live stream where you can chat to myself live there, ask questions, and we talk about current events and whatnot. Uh, what else have we got? Behind the scenes videos, Q&A stuff. Anyway, if you're interested, the links for that stuff is in the video description. If not though, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.